Just making sure we're already recording. Okay. okay, everyone, thanks for being here this afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. And hello to those of you who are joining us from Zoom. So, today we're really thrilled and excited to have with us Neil Schiller from the University of Leiden. For those of you who don't know Neil, his work spans a whole plethora of aspects of language. Boston, production, comprehension, and currently their neural correlates thereof. Got a background, got a PhD from the Max Planck Institute in the late 90s, has gone on to postdoc work in Harvard, Musk, and then moved to Mustang, and now Leiden is the current place. I first met Niels actually through uh, one of his old PhD students who was doing some really cool work with grammatical processing and neural correlates in life. Don't know if it's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, but it's very, very interesting to hear about it. So today he'll be presenting something a bit more specifically on the possibility of the syntactic features during language discussion. Well, without further ado, we'll take it. thank you very much, uh, Vince, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, and thanks for reminding me of when I got my PhD a long time ago. Um, so um, hello everyone, hello everyone on Zoom. Um, thanks uh, uh, very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I arrived last night and it's been great so far here in uh, Tromsø. I've never been here before, so um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, the weather not so much, but, um, but, but this is nothing you can do about any, you can do anything about. Um, so what I'm going to do today is um, talking about um, the processing of mobile syntactic features uh, in language production. And um, uh, I'm sure that some of you, for example, um, um, Marit, but also Jason, um, have heard part of, the, of this talk before. But um, um, nevertheless, I threw in some new data and I'm trying to make um, this uh, an exciting story. And I have to make sure that we are all on the same page. So um, I, let me start right away. I hope you are awake because you will be confronted with lots of data. I will also try to teach you some German and some Dutch in the meantime, and um, tell you a lot about morphological uh, uh, processing and, and morphosyntactic processing of, of uh, uh, yeah, grammatical features and also classifiers at some point. So let me give you an overview of my talk first. So I will um, first um, briefly introduce you to the skill of speaking and um, tell you something about psycholinguistic research on, on, on speech production, especially introducing um, um, a model or some models to you. Um, further, then I will move on to, um, and this is actually the largest part of my talk, to talk about uh, psycholinguistic evidence for the processing of um, um, grammatical gender. Um, then I will switch gears and move to field-based psycholinguistics because I have some cool data about, um, at least I think it's cool data, about gender congruency effects in, um, in a, in a non-Western language in an African language, actually. Um, then I will switch gears again and talk about um, a different part of, um, or different kind of uh, syntactic features, and that is classifiers, classifiers in Mandarin Chinese. Um, and I will, um, uh, if there's time left, I will also talk about um, morphosyntactic uh, feature processing in second language, um, 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 yeah, speakers of a second language. So that's a lot, I realize, and if we have to, um, if there's no time left, we can stop anywhere, and I just would like to ask Vince to give me a sign when it's, when it's too much, okay? Okay, so bear with me. So um, uh, speaking, um, I'm sure lots of, many of you have, have seen um, this model uh, before. This is an um, uh, illustration of the model by Pim Lefeld and his colleagues. Um, about speech production. Now, this is not the only model of speech production, of course, there are other models, but, but the models basically um, resemble each other quite a bit in that they all assume a component where um, we um, prepare the semantic and syntactic uh, uh, output 
Um, then there's a mental lexicon, and then there is a second uh, component of the model where um, the um, form encoding takes place. Okay, so you have this is the first component, this is the mental lexicon, and then this is the the form encoding. Um, uh, yeah, uh, part of the of the model. And uh, models vary a little bit about uh, what they assume in terms of um, um, processing, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, order, and also timing, and whether they are interactive or not. But but these are um, I wouldn't say details, but but um, um, these are things that do not that are not that important today. Um, so some just some facts about language um, uh, production and about speaking. Um, now, as you have seen in the model already, the architecture of the language uh, production system is quite complex. And um, speech production is certainly um, a skill, if not the most um, uh, complex skill that human beings have. And it's quite cognitively quite taxing, and it involves a lot of planning. Now, approximately, when we speak, approximately 40 different uh, muscles are involved in producing speech. And every five minutes, milliseconds, approximately one muscle event is executed. So it's, it's a fast um, um, succession of, um, of events. Uh, nevertheless, though, our speech production system is amazingly robust and we um, make relatively few errors. It's estimated that we make one, less than one speech error per thousand words. And um, until the 1980s, approximately, speech error research was the main um, source of evidence for the speech production um, um, system and speech production research. Now, nowadays, what we mainly do in the lab is we use lab-based tasks um, to investigate speech production. So what we do, for example, is that we present a picture um, to our participants. Um, the participants will then engage into a some processes of speech planning, and then we can measure the output again, so the response. So for example, if we um, show this picture and the participant is a Dutch participant, then they, um, they would say something like stool, the equivalent of chair at some point. Well, I mean, actually this is a fast process and it only um, takes about 600 milliseconds to name a picture on average. Um, now, some of the, um, ongoing debates involve the following questions. So one question, for example, that is still unresolved is how many steps are really involved in speech production? Going from concept to lemma to a lexeme, is there really a lemma? Um, um, is the lemma and the lexeme maybe the same thing? These are all um, um, questions that are still unresolved. Um, another question concerns the time course of activation or the time course of processing, namely whether the processing is discrete going from one level to the next, or whether there's cascading or even interactive activation during the system or in the system. So is there also um, activation that comes, for example, from lower levels and activates back to higher levels? Um, and finally, the question about lexical selection, whether it is um, by competition or whether it's by exclusion. So these are some of the questions that are still going on in the literature. And the um, research that I'm, I'm showing you today um, is able to contribute to some of these questions. So what you can do, um, for example, is ask um, participants not only to ask to, to name a picture, but also to name a picture in a more complex way. Like for example, um, not say just um, stool, chair, um, but say something like the red chair, the rode stool, okay? So why is this interesting? Well, uh, because it, this, these kinds of phrases involve the selection of grammatical or syntactic information, for, for instance, grammatical gender. Um, now, you have to know that determiners are gender marked in Dutch noun phrases and that they must agree in gender with the head noun, okay? So um, this gives us the opportunity to actually investigate noun phrases um, uh, and the selection of syntactic features in lexical access. Um, this is an overview um, of um, the word start, meaning state, that I published a couple of years ago with my colleague Lindsay Nichols and some other colleagues, where we um, tried to um, give a um, representation of um, different levels, of a lexical level, a, a concept level, and a word form level. 
um, um, and the um, features that are, uh, for example, connected to the word uh, start um, in terms of gender and number. There, of course, there are still other features. For example, in German, you also have case. Um, in English, you still have you still have other features. Um, and um, this is just to show that the system is really, even when you just look at one word, it seems to be um, like a network that's really complex and almost impossible to grasp. So it's, it's, it's really something challenging to think about how we select the um, lexical uh, syntactic features when we produce noun phrases um, on, uh, on the spot. Okay. So let's look at um, um, grammatical gender a little bit closer. So um, we know that many languages distinguish several um, um, uh, grammatical genders. Um, we also know that there are some um, um, essays occasions, like for example, Dante, a, um, an Italian patient that has been investigated, for example, by um, um, Bill Bardiker and his, his colleagues, who, is, who was able to, um, to know the grammatical gender of words that he could not produce. So when you would confront him with a um, picture naming task, he could not name the picture, so he was anomic, but he could tell whether the name of the picture was, for example, masculine or feminine in, um, in Italian. And um, there's also a difference from the tip of the tongue phenomenon um, in cases where people cannot come out with the, with the word they want to say, but they know what gender the word has. Yeah? So these are all well-known phenomena and there are other phenomena that seem to suggest that there is a level in between the semantics, in between the meaning and the phonology of the word. Okay, so um, let's look at the Dutch gender system. Um, as many of you may have may know, um, Dutch has two different genders and these two genders are marked by two different articles. For example, uh, we have the tafel, the table, versus uh, head book, the book. Okay, good. Um, my uh, colleague Herbert Schriefers was the first to investigate um, the processing of these uh, grammatical features in speech production by running the following experiment. Herbert exposed Dutch participants to um, colored pictures, so for example, this red chair, and um, um, at the same time uh, presented a distractor word to them. Okay, so this is called the uh, picture word interference paradigm. It's a very well-known paradigm in speech production. And um, in this case, the distractor word, fruit in this case, either had the same gender as the uh, target object or it had a different um, gender. So it was either gender congruent or gender incongruent, okay? Now, people, uh, participants in both cases had to say the rode stool and ignore the distractor word. Now, we know from earlier research that people have trouble ignoring the or neglecting the um, distractor word. And so what, what Habit found was the following. He found um, significantly faster naming latencies for the object in the case where the um, distractor word had the same gender as um, the target object name okay and he said well this effect of gender congruency um, could be accounted for by competition in the selection of a word syntactic properties at the lemma level so just to illustrate this um, um, so here on the on the right um, you see the production system so here you have the picture um, electrical concept has to be selected a lemma is selected and then the word forms are selected and at the, at the lemma level, there's also that place where the syntactic features are represented, okay? Now, when you look here on the other side, this is the uh, comprehension side. So the um, uh, distractor word is presented in, in, in written. It's activating a word form in the lexicon, activating a, um, um, a lemma, and um, then also activating its corresponding um, uh, syntactic feature or gender feature. And Herbert said, well, Herbert Schriefer said, well, when these two gender features are uh, not the same, they are in competition, and therefore people are delayed in naming the target object. Now, um, 
<clears throat> Further investigation of this phenomenon um, uh, led to a study carried out by uh, Vido Lahai. Um, and the interesting um, part of this study is that Vido was able to um, replicate um, the effect that habits found with determinant noun and the determinant noun naming condition. So um, the congruent, when the distractor word was congruent, the reaction times were faster than when it was incongruent. However, <clears throat> and this is something that Herbert did not test in the beginning, is when you have a bare noun naming condition, so when you just ask people to, to, to name the picture by the bare noun, so just saying book in this case, there's no difference between the two conditions. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, because um, it seems to be the case that um, gender selection is a non-competitive automatic process, but um, the competition actually occurs at the level of the determiner selection. Um, so when the determiner forms of the um, um, distractor and the target word are different, that's where the competition occurs. So going back to the illustration, now um, we have um, also a representation of the two determiners here. So when you have to select the determiner, that's where the competition occurs. So it's occurring actually at the word form level, right? Um, so um, I'm trying to, um, to tell you now why this difference, difference competition at the lemma level versus competition at the word form level is important. So the question of course is, um, now we have two accounts for one for the same phenomenon. Um, 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 it would be nice to, to, to disentangle these, right? Um, so what you have to know is that effects of gender congruency um, are only visible when the determiner can be selected on the basis of the gender information alone. Um, I'm telling you this because there are languages like, for example, Italian, where the gender of the, or where the form of the determiner not only depends on the gender of the, uh, of the noun, but also on the, on the form of the noun. <clears throat> So, for example, words that, that start with certain sounds, like zucchero, for example, which is masculine, does not take the um, uh, determiner il, but it's lo zucchero, right? So you cannot, um, 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 uh, you cannot select and activate, activate and select, I should say, the determiner form before you have encoded the noun phonologically. Furthermore, um, it's the case, it has to be the case that a choice between, has to be made between different forms of a determiner, because otherwise there cannot be competition between different determiners, right? If there's only one determiner, like in English, you will not see uh, um, uh, gender congruence defects. Okay, so let's go back to Dutch. Dutch has a very nice property, and we took advantage of that property, namely that in the, um, in the singular, as I've already told you, there are two different determinant forms for the two different genders. Now in the plural, there's only one determiner that covers both, um, both genders, namely de. So it's de tafels, but it's also de boeken. Yeah? Now this gives us the opportunity to test actually the hypothesis whether the competition takes place at the, at the gender level or whether the competition takes place at the determiner level. Because if the determiner account is correct, then effects of gender congruency should be visible in Dutch in the singular, but not in the plural, because in the plural, there's only one determiner. So there cannot be any competition in the plural. However, if the syntactic feature account is correct, um, effects of gender congruency should be visible in Dutch in the singular, but also in the plural. We tested this in, ex in an experiment where we um, again presented participants with pictures and um, distractor words. And there was a congruent, gender congruent condition and a gender incongruent condition. And then we also presented them with a plural condition um, where they just have to um, uh, name the object in the plural. Okay. And what we found was that we, we replicated the original effect by uh, Schrieffers in the singular. So this is the gender congruent condition and it gave us significantly faster um, reaction times than in the incongruent condition. In the plural, however, there was no effect. So um, these two um, 
um, conditions are indistinguishable for, from each other. And importantly, the interaction between the plural and the gender congruency was uh, significant in this experiment. So what does this mean? Well, basically shows and gives us evidence that the um, 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 uh, selection and uh, competition seems to take place at the word form level when the uh, correct determiner form is to be selected by the speaker. And when there is um, 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 in, the, in the gender congruent condition, um, there's of course um, uh, no competition because there's only one word form to select from. Okay. <clears throat> Um, interestingly, um, Audrey Berkey and her um, collaborators, um, a couple of years later, uh, replicated this effect um, in German, uh, German speakers that were tested in France. Um, and Audrey also asked a question about the processing of the two words composing an NP, whether they are, whether the activation, activation is simultaneously or separable in time. Um, first of all, <clears throat> Audrey nicely replicated the um, gender congruency effect. So this is from her uh, Cognition 2016 paper. Um, and then um, um, she used the um, um, picture word interference paradigm, um, but she also um, used distractor words that were either related in form, in phonological form to the, uh, to the noun, or they were related in syntax to the noun. And then she measured also ERPs and uh, found that, the, um, that there were different time windows um, that were significant for the activation of the phonological form of the words and for the syntactic features. Um, yeah, suggesting that the access to the noun word forms occurs prior to the accessing of the determiner word form, even in what's called an early selection language such as German, where the determiner can already be selected at the point in time um, when you do not even have the phonology of the word. So it's her, her um, uh, conclusion was that there seems to be at least some sequential processing taking part. So these are the, um, the uh, um, um, some, 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 some uh, uh, figures of her, um, of her paper. So what you see here is that um, this is the, uh, yeah, this is, this is unfortunate because the um, um, figures are a little bit cut. But what you can see here is the, um, is the, the, the difference between the two genders. Um, and um, um, uh, um, let me see. And here you see some, some, of the, some, of the, some of the electrodes that were significant in the selected time frame. So the time frame is basically for the gender congruency was very close to the activation, about 200 milli, around 200 milliseconds before people started to, to articulate um, um, the effects of gender congruency were, were visible, whereas the phonological um, effects were visible much earlier. Okay. Um, now, um, what we also did um, was, because the original effect by, by, by Schrieffers was done in a uh, determiner adjective noun phrase, and we had never tested that in the beginning, but we decided we should also replicate that, and we did, okay? So we also find it in a case where people have to uh, produce an adjective, a determiner adjective noun phrase, and again, you can see that there's the um, gender congruency effect. So that seems to be fine. Now, the interesting thing now is that you can play around with this um, quite, 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 in quite interesting ways. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, in the, in, the, in the standard format, there are two determiners in Dutch for the two genders. Uh, however, we can also use a diminutive case, right? Where people say something like um, the small chair, het stoeltje, or the small bed, het bedje. Now, as you notice, again, there's um, only one determiner for both genders, right? It's like, it's, it's similar to German actually where you um, have the same determiner for uh, diminutive uh, words. Um, so um, you, could always, you could already predict what would happen. And the interesting thing is that, that, that the effect should swap between a standard format and the diminutive format. So the syntactic feature account would predict that, the, um, that we should find gender congruency effects um, um, if they are due to uh, gender feature selection, 
in, um, in certain cases. So um, for example, when you have um, a condition where you have the diminutive and a distractor word, um, a diminutive form of a common gender noun and a, um, um, another uh, uh, word that also has common gender. Um, if you compare this to a condition where the distractor word is neuter, um, you should um, then the, uh, gender, the syntactic feature account would um, favorite this condition here, right? So this would be the condition where the two have the same uh, gender feature. Now the um, determiner account would predict something else. The determiner account would predict that the condition where the determiner is the same, that this, this, should, this should be the so-called winner, right? This should be the faster condition. So we tested this. So in this experiment, um, people saw a um, fixation cross and then after 500 milliseconds, a voice key was activated and they saw a, um, a picture and the distractor word, okay? Um, <clears throat> another 300 milliseconds later, they were confronted with a tone, either high tone or low tone. The low tone would say, um, would indicate that they have to produce a standard noun phrase and the high tone would indicate that they have to produce a diminutive noun phrase. Um, now this is the, the what, these are the results of the um, standard format. Um, so for the standard format, um, the uh, um, results are quite, um, quite straightforward. As you would expect for the common gender uh, nouns, um, they are faster when the distractor also has common gender than when it has compared to the case when it has neuter gender. And for the neuter gender nouns, the other way around, right? Neuter faster than um, um, uh, 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 common gender. Now, the interesting case is, of course, now what happens in the diminutive case, right? So let's first look at the right side, the neuter um, gender word, the neuter gender target. They remain faster with the neuter gender distractor than with the common gender distractor. Now, let's look at the common gender word. They swap. See that? They are now faster. So saying producing head stewardship is faster. You're faster to do that when the distractor word is harsh, another head word, than when it is um, a do word. So the effect flips if you compare this with the, uh, let me see, with the um, previous, with the standard format, look at the, at the left side of the, of, the, of the figure, the effect swaps. Okay. So you can, you can really play around with this in, in very nice ways. And it's a, it's a really robust effect. We have found it in, in, in many, many experiments and we even replicated the um, diminutive case with another, in, another, uh, in another format where we pre um, presented either small or big pictures and it also works uh, very well. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, 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 yeah, robust effect, I would say. And um, this is just to say that this, um, the effect that I've just showed you reminds me or reminded, um, may remind you of an effect that was um, um, found by uh, my colleague Nils Janse and Alfonso Karamazza a long time ago, where they <coughs> um, had people produce um, just, just um, pictures without a distractor word. So they had people produce either this stool, the, the chair or um, 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 the small chair. Um, versus um, the bat um, um, compared to the small bat. And um, what they found was that the um, reaction time increased in both conditions for the, for, the, for the diminutive, but it increased much more for the common gender nouns because these words now had to switch articles, right? So there was a competition going on according to them when, they, when people had to select the, the article whereas this was not the case for the neuter gender word. So it's, it's very comparable to that. Okay, um, now um, adjectives. Um, so Schrief has found in his original paper that the effect was also um, um, there when people had to produce a, an adjective and a noun. So also adjectives are inflected for gender in Dutch so you have, for example, a rode stool, red chair, versus 
wrote book, uh, uh, Red Book, okay? So, um, so when Schrieffers used these two conditions, um, he found that the effect was also there. We tried this as well, and we did not find the effect. And we think um, that, there is a, that there is really a um, fundamental difference between this condition here and the condition where you use determinants. Um, and um, so we, we think that the, that the effect is really reflecting um, um, the case that the gender marked freestanding morphemes, that they are selected uh, following a, what we call a selection by competition principle. Um, however, gender marked <clears throat> uh, morphemes are retrieved as a consequence of a phonological transformation process. Um, and they are not um, selected competitively from the lexicon, okay? Now, Schrieffers um, published some other work where um, they claim that um, this is not the case. Gender congruency is observed whenever a gender mark element corresponds to a closed class noun or closed class morpheme, so either a determiner or an inflection or something else, which is located in the, in the initial position of an utterance, okay? Um, and this, these are the conditions that are sufficient to um, get the, to find the grammatical gender uh, congruency effect. Um, so uh, my colleague Albert Costa and I thought, okay, let's, 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 let's try and see whether we can, we, can, we can find this, whether we can confirm this. So what we did is we compared um, a German case with, an indefinite, indefinite um, uh, format. Uh, so in the indefinite format, for example, uh, you distinguish in German between the, um, you say, ein Tisch, a table, but eine Tür, okay? So um, the um, indefinite article behaves a little bit like it's inflected, basically, right? So it behaves a little bit like the, um, or actually it behaves like the, like the adjective. Um, so when we tested this case in, and we, we did the, um, uh, the manipulations, we did not find any difference between the gender congruent and the gender incongruent case. However, we took exactly the same material and just altered the um, instructions that we gave to our participants. Now the participants had to not use the indefinite format, but the definite format. So they had to use either there or D and the um, congruency effect is, appears again. So which shows that, that it's, it's, it's really, it really has to do with a competitive um, selection process of these determiner word form at a word form lab. Um, what I would also like to present to you is some, um, some work on the neural correlates of these, um, of grammatical um, gender processing in German. And I've just, um, given you here a couple of sentences that, that show you that grammatical gender is really everywhere. Because in German, we can have sentences like uh, das Auto parkt vor der Garage, and then to refer to car, to, um, to the car here, you would have to use a, a, um, a pronoun that is gender marked, okay? So you have to know that the car, for example, is, is neuter in order to select the right um, um, the right uh, uh, um, pronoun. Whereas you could also have a case like das Auto parked vor der Garage, sie ist grün, and then you would everybody would know that um, because this is feminine now that it re refers to garage. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 really the case that 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 grammatical gender and grammatical gender agreement is very um, um, very much um, everywhere in the German language. Um, so this is a study that I um, did together with Stefan Heim and uh, Angela Friedrichi. So where we um, had people in the scanner um, doing a picture word interference experiment. And we used um, um, a sparse scanning procedure where the scanner um, was um, set off for a period of two seconds when the picture was presented and when people gave actually the answer and named the picture, okay? So they saw pictures like, like, like the ones I've shown you before. Um, they were um, scanned, um, then the scanner was um, set off. Uh, they named the picture and the scanner was set on again. 
Um, these are where the reaction times. So um, here, for uh, you can see that we found the um, uh, the gender congruency effect actually for for all the three gender um, words. So for the for the masculine, feminine, and for the neuter words. Um, so we replicated the effect once again. Um, it's a little bit boring, I know, but it's just I cannot do anything about it. We we find the effect every time. What you see here is the brain activity, and when you look at the um, um, uh, yellow effects, the yellow the yellow color, um, the yellow color reflects a conjunction analysis of the um, of the two conditions versus um, uh, the control condition. So it reflects uh, the gender uh, processing. And when Stefan actually looked into the data more precisely, he found that there was a steeper slope of the hemodynamic um, um, response function in the gender congruent than in the gender incongruent condition in a particular area of the left inferior frontal gyrus um, that's marked here, um, which is in the vicinity of uh, Broadman area 44. So um, it shows that um, the summing up uh, a little bit for the first part, um, the behavioral evidence that I showed you demonstrates a role for lexical syntactic features like grammatical gender during um, language processing. Um, I also showed you um, electrophysiological evidence um, and um, neuroimaging data that demonstrates an active role of Broadman area 44. Okay, good. So in so what is what does it mean theoretically? Let me take a sip of water so you can relax. So what does it mean um, theoretically? It means that that the data that I've showed you so far actually supports the determiner um, competition account, but not so much the syntactic feature account. Um, so it it basically says that that um, well, I mean, there's, and I should say that there's even more data from other languages that support the um, determinant competition account. For example, there's data from Croatian um, that shows the same thing. So in the end, it's, it, it, it's basic, it seems to be the case. I mean, we have to be careful, of course, because we never can be sure completely, but there is a lot of evidence that suggests that the grammatical features are activated automatically but that the determiner form selection, that this is the, 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 the stage where the competition takes place. And this is why the gender congruency effect um, um, turns up in the, in the first place. Okay, good. Um, how do I do time-wise? That's good, okay. Um, so let's switch gears now to um, what I call field-based psycholinguistics. And of course, it's also about gender congruency to confuse you not too much. Um, first of all, we all know that there are about 7,000 different languages in the world. Now, if you think about research that's being carried out in experimental linguistics, so in, in neurolinguistics and in, in psycholinguistics, and you um, look about how many languages are actually investigated, it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing. Because it's, when, you, when, you, when you look at the top 10, for example, you see that 70% of the, of the language, 70% of all papers, and this is now um, a uh, account that I did for 15 years of these four languages, four journals. And it's probably, I don't know whether it's representative, but, but I think um, it may be, because I don't see any reason why it should be different in other journals. Um, so when you do the count, you see that 70% of all the papers, of all the papers that are published about experimental um, language research are only on a handful of languages. And they are all uh, either Germanic or Romance. Of course, the biggest part is English. 45% of all the research that's being published is on English. And then, um, yeah, there's German, there's Dutch, there's French. And then, and then you know, it, it goes already into smaller percentages. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, this, is, this is something, um, it's, it's, it's not available. So um, these are actually papers where it was not explicitly mentioned which language um, it was about. 
Um, and um, presumably this was also, they did not mention it because it was also English, but we could not be sure which language it was in the end, okay? Um, okay, so um, on, the, on the one hand, we have 7,000 different languages. On the other hand, we only have seven languages which cover like a vast amount of all the research that's being done in psycholinguistics. So this should be, um, we, should, we should all do and try and do something about this. And, and as you can see, um, um, yeah, Norwegian is somewhere here, but you could all do something here in, uh, in, in Norway about this to, um, to uh, promote uh, Norwegian a little bit more. Um, so we tried um, to do um, experimental research on a language called Konso, which is a, con a Kuchitic language. Here you see the area of Kuchitic languages in East Africa. Um, and Konso is a small language spoken by about 250,000 people in the southwest of Ethiopia, um, um, uh, in the region that neighbors actually uh, Kenya. And we had um, a PhD student um, who went there to actually do experimental research there. Now, why did we do this, right, in the first place? Well, the theoretical motivation was that um, um, Kuchitic languages like Konso um, um, have a very nice or very interesting feature in the sense that gender and number are interrelated in a, in a complex way. So um, what people, the theoretical linguists and descriptivists have argued about is whether there is actually a third gender besides masculine and feminine. And this gender has been called by some people plural gender. Now, why has this been called plural gender? Um, <clears throat> uh, because it has the same feature marking as the plural in Konso. So in Konso, for example, the, the gender is marked in the um, subject inflection on the verb. Um, so here you have examples. I will not even dare to pronounce this, but, but um, as you can see, there is feminine gender for some words. There's masculine gender um, for, for other words. Um, and there is, oops, there is, um, so for example, boy has um, plural gender. Why? Because it has the same marking, both, both the um, um, definite determiners on the noun and the um, marking, the gender marking on the verb are the same as in the case, for example, where there is real um, uh, plural marking. Um, so therefore, it has been suggested that this um, singular marking is actually a case of plural gender. Now that's interesting. So here you have the paradigm, um, what it looks like, what, what the definite suffixes look like, what the gender markers look like. So we thought, okay, this is an interesting case where we could um, use or provide our experimental methods to um, um, potentially contribute to a theoretical this, um, 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 argument. So the questions that we had was that um, where, whether, whether there is gender congruency in Konso in the first place, I mean, this is, this is important to establish, and does, if, if so, whether the plural gender behaves like other gender features in Konso or whether it behaves more like a number feature. And for number features, we already know that there, is, um, um, there are no, no congruency effects. So, um, so we did, um, um, and we also, yeah, so this is, we also wanted to do this to get cross-linguistic confirmation for the cycling, for psycholinguistic theories from non-Western languages. So Mulugeta Tsegaye was the PhD student who actually went to Africa, went to, to Ethiopia um, three times, to carry out um, uh, psycholinguistic experiments with Konso speakers um, there, and there are lots of challenges. I mean, just to, to mention some, some one, one thing is that there is not always electricity, right? So he had to rent his, he had to rent a, a, a generator, um, a fuel generator to, to um, be able to uh, recharge the laptop uh, from time to time. Um, but this is just, just, this is just one thing. So when you go and do field work, experimental work in Africa, it has lots of challenges. <clears throat> so the task that he asked people to, his participants to do was actually a picture naming task, very similar to the one that we already saw. 
Um, so he had different conditions um, and he used this. So, uh, so he used um, non-plural words like masculine and feminine, but he also used the plural gender words in the experiment. Um, okay, I will swap this. Um, another thing that was making things complicated is that um, Conso does not have a script. So what we had to do was to record the distractor words before hand and present them auditorily. Um, so um, the um, distractor words were presented auditorily, the pictures were presented visually, and they could either occur in a gender incongruent condition or in a gender congruent condition, right? And we did this with, um, um, yeah, with plural gender words, but also with non-plural gender words, like a masculine gender word, okay? Um, and um, what we found was for the uh, singular, single object uh, naming condition, there was a, um, a large um, gender congruency effect, um, like we saw before in, in, in Western languages. Um, what we also did um, was to present um, um, multiple pictures. And this is an interesting case because now what you, the effect should, should swap, right? Because when the um, uh, distractor word is actually, um, um, it's a plural gender word, then the incongruent condition should become the congruent condition in terms of, 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 of the um, determiner reference. So it should be um, faster than the gender congruent condition. And this was actually the case. The only thing is that this effect here was not significant, okay? So it's a little bit, um, we, we do not exactly know what's going on, okay? Um, but in any case, the pattern, the pattern changes from the singular naming to the plural naming. Okay. Um, so what we also did was to use another, um, a different response um, category, namely an, a sentence naming category. So now people had to say they were shown a picture and they had to say like the bone was shown or the tree was shown, okay? So, yeah. And um, we did the same experiment with the same uh, um, slightly different, different um, um, words, but with the same distractors. And um, what we found was, again, there was a, um, um, a huge effect in the singular, uh, in the single object naming case. And um, when we presented um, two objects in the plural, um, the effect again switched, but again, the difference was not significant. So um, um, it's not completely clear what's going on here. Um, um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting data. Um, and what we think is that um, um, we were able to show that there is a gender congruency effect in the singular uh, naming condition and that we replicated this effect. And so um, um, what we believe is the case is that the plural gender is a proper gender value in, um, in CONSO. And that um, this demonstrates that psycholinguistic investigations um, can provide um, additional empirical evidence and help to um, 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 give us cross-linguistic evidence for, for the experimental findings that we investigate. So more work like this should be done. Now, let me turn to classifiers. Classifiers in Mandarin Chinese. <clears throat> so classifiers are also an inherent feature of nouns in, in, in Chinese. Um, so they are, for example, numeral classifiers, uh, but also other classifiers. And you have to use these classifiers, for example, when you um, um, uh, produce a uh, quantifier classifier noun phrase. So for example, when you say one chair, you have to use the classifier, okay? Or when you, when you want to produce the phrase two chairs, you have to say two classifier chair, okay? Um, now, the classifiers are partly predictable from things like animacy, function of a word, shape, size, and texture. However, they are not, um, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the semantic features of a noun and the classifier. And the semantic overlap is influential, we know that, for the classifiers, but it's not dominant. At least this has been claimed in the, in the literature. So what we did, and this is work by uh, Man Wang, 
um, as part of her dissertation is to present um, people, uh, participants, trained participants with a picture and to have a distractor word that was either uh, semantically related, like mouse, for example, so rabbit is the target and the um, um, semantically related uh, word is mouse or cow. All the words were um, the same in classifier or they used a different classifier. Okay, so it's a two by two design, either semantically related or unrelated and classifier congruent or incongruent. Okay, and MUN actually um, uh, measured reaction times, but also EGs. <clears throat> As you can see here, um, this is the, these are the congruent cases. These are the incongruent cases. This is semantically related. This is semantically unrelated. Um, she found a semantic interference effect. So the semantically related um, distractors um, produce a longer naming latency. This is a well-known effect. It shows that there's competition going on between the distractor word and the target. So when you see rabbit and the distractor word is mouse, you are slower than when the distractor word is not an animal. Okay. Um, however, when we look at the classifier congruency, um, she did not find a difference in the naming latency. However, when we look at the ERPs, we see an effect not only um, in the um, semantic category condition, what we believe is in, in reflecting an N400 effect, but we also see a very similar effect in the classifier condition, okay, approximately in the same time window. So here you see the significant electrodes and the significant time windows for this classifier congruency effect. Um, and here you see the semantic effect, um, very similar. Um, so it seems to be the case that there is no significant classifier effect in the naming latency, so pre and now naming, um, suggesting that the selection of the classifier of the lexical syntactic features is bypassed. However, um, the um, difference that we found in the ERPs seem to suggest that there is um, automatic activation of the classifier information in we are now naming as well. Okay, and as you, as I've already shown you, um, this fits very well together with the claims um, made by Vidula Lahai who did not find a, an effect in bear now naming um, for the gender feature either, but he, did, he only found it when, when the determiner was used. Now we carried this on and now um, this is work by um, Xiaoyan Huang, um, who actually um, extended the work of Man Wang by um, introducing another condition where she manipulated the number of the, um, of the objects. So here in this case, people either had to produce two, op two um, um, had to say two knives, or in another condition, we presented three knives and they had to produce three knives, okay? So there was variation, but um, in this case, people did not have to produce the bare noun, but they had to produce a uh, classifier, a numeral, classifier noun facts. And the rest, uh, the conditions were, were the same. So um, there were conditions where the semantics was um, um, related of the class of the, of the distractors to the target like fork and plate and where it was unrelated. And there was um, also um, the words either had the same, they used the same classifier or they used different classifier. So what, um, Xiaoyan um, found was again um, a uh, semantic effect. So the semantic condition was always um, slower than the, than the semantic unrelated condition, but she also found a, um, an effect of um, uh, um, classified congruency. So both effects were significant. Um, so the semantic relatedness effect, but also the classifiers um, uh, um, uh, effect, uh, the classifier, uh, um, classifier congruency effect, uh, and there was no um, interaction um, uh, according to her um, general mixed model analysis. So when we look at the um, um, when we look at the, um, um, the ERPs, um, she looked at three different time windows. 
and there was actually an effect um, in, the, in the time window after 400 milliseconds um, uh, that was significant for the classifier congruency, but also for the semantic relatedness. Um, and here you see, um, so for the, um, on the right side, you see the, um, the classifier effect. So you can see that there is a difference between the incongruent and the congruent condition um, starting to show up approximately at 400 milliseconds. So this is very similar to the um, data that um, um, Man Wang was, uh, um, um, had reported before. Um, and um, just to compare these two studies, so here you see the, um, the first study that I showed you on classifier processing by Man Wang. Here is the um, 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 later study by uh, Xiao Yu uh, Huang. And um, it, really, it really fits in with everything we know so far. So um, the one study showing automatic activation, the other study showing also competition select, competitive selection of the, of the classifiers. Okay. Um, where's the time? Okay, that's, that's fine, that's fine. I, I will just show you, I will just very quickly because we are all interested in, in, in multilingualism and also in, in, in second language processing. So I, we, we started, we just started a couple of years ago to also look into morphosyntactic process or the processing of morphosyntactic features in second language processing. Um, so first of all, this is, this is very new data that a um, PhD student of mine, um, Xiao Yu uh, Wang, um, just finished, um, just com she just completed the um, collection and the analysis. Uh, so these are Dutch L1 speakers who learn Chinese at a relatively um, high level. So these speakers were, I think they were about B1 or B2 level. Um, and um, we tested whether um, we can also find these effects of um, uh, classifier congruency and classifier processing um, in a uh, in this in the in the speech production of, of an L2 speaker. Um, so uh, the task here was um, a picture was shown, a distractor word was shown in Chinese, and people had to name the picture in Mandarin using an NP um, formed by a quantifier, a classifier, and a nap. Okay, so for example, one table. Um, what um, uh, Xiao Yu found was in the reaction times that there were um, uh, faster reaction times for the semantically unrelated than the related condition, right? And this was true for the um, classifier congruent and for the incongruent uh, data. And there was also a classifier congruency effect of um, um, approximately um, 25 to 24 milliseconds. So the congruent cases were um, uh, faster than the incongruent cases. She also looked at um, ERPs and what she found there was again in the same, approximately in the same time window, um, the um, um, uh, voltages for the incongruent classifier incongruent cases were more uh, negative than for the congruent condition. Um, and um, the same was true for, uh, for the semantics. Actually replicating um, the data by Xiao Yu Wang, um, uh, sorry, Xiao Yu Huang uh, um, that I presented to you earlier. Okay, so this is, this is very nice. And this is, as I said, it's, it's, it's um, um, uh, it just comes from the, from, not even from the press, it's even uh, uh, fresher than this. Uh, so it's not even um, um, uh, published, um, uh, not even submitted, but I, um, um, it's just, uh, just, uh, she just gave these data to me uh, 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 last month. Um, now we also looked into um, L2, into gender processing in L2, and I would just, just very quickly, so this is work by um, um, Sarah von Grebner. So what Sarah did actually was um, in a picture naming paradigm, um, looking at the speech of German speakers who learn Spanish, okay? And she presented um, uh, pictures to them, no distractor word in this case, but the manipulation that she did was whether the word had the same gender in German and Spanish, like uh, die Erdbeere, la fresa, 
um, versus uh, der Schlüssel la chiave. Um, so, so either there was um, uh, a, uh, there was correspondence, or there was a mismatch between the between the between the genders. So what she found was that, and she also manipulated um, the cognate status of the distractor words. <clears throat> I will not go into this. Uh, she also found very nice effects of cognates. Um, but what 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 she um, um, what she also found was um, gender effects. So people were not only more accurate for the congruent condition than for the incongruent condition, but they also were faster, okay? And this is work that has been published uh, in Neuropsychologia, um, um, uh, um, just came out uh, uh, last year, um, also showing that you can find these effects of, 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 of gender processing also in L2 uh, learners. Once they have established a certain level, of, uh, of proficiency in their second language, okay? Now I will switch, um, I will skip this and I will come to my general conclusions. So I've, I've, I know I'm, I'm, I'm realizing I'm having thrown, I've thrown a lot of data to you, but it's basically to, um, to show you that um, the behavioral evidence that we have um, demonstrates a role for grammatical gender in the language processing system. Um, and that the selection of, gen of gender features affects language production in case it is reflected by freestanding um, uh, uh, morphemes, by, by freestanding free word forms. Um, I also showed you some evidence from field-based psycholinguistics, and I think we have to make an effort to do more, doing also research on languages that are under research um, to get more um, cross-linguistic evidence for, the, for our models and our claims. Um, and um, I've also shown that there are also, there may also be other morphosyntactic features that behave very similar to gender, namely, for example, classifiers. And it's interesting to um, also think about um, these features when we talk about grammatical gender and morphosyntactic features in general. And this is, these are the people who, um, who did all the real work. Uh, I will just acknowledge them quickly. So this is Mulugeta Tsigaye, uh, Man Wang, Xiaoyu Wang, Xiaoyu Huang. Uh, this is Xiaoyu Wang, uh, Sara von Grebna and Leticia Pablos who was involved in uh, Sara's study. Uh, so um, this is an, a picture from, from, from Ethiopia actually. Um, and um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to um, take questions. I see there's something in the chat. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Alexander. What, what do you mean by same form uh, of the noun? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a good point, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. so. Um, mm. um, get a little bit sip. Very well spot. So um, we did the, um, obviously we did the <clears throat> experiments on, 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 the, on German and Dutch. We did them before we did the um, experiments on console. So um, when we did the experiments on console, we thought, um, and we found uh, the effect that I presented, we thought, okay, this seems to contradict our earlier results. 
in, um, in the Germanic language. Because now we find, in fact, even when the, when, when the um, um, uh, gender marking uh, element is on the, on the noun and it's not freestanding. However, um, and we thought, okay, we have to, we have to, um, yeah, we have to write this up and 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 say, okay, we may we may have been wrong in the in the in in in, in, in the first place, or it works differently. But in any case, I mean, data are data, so yeah, it's, it's so we, we find something different here. However, um, I gave this talk earlier in um, at Macquarie University, and um, as you you may remember that um, um, Conso is not does not have a written form, does not have a script. So the um, scripting that you, or the, these, these, are, these are transcriptions basically. And Catherine Demeth um, said that there are arguments, theoretical arguments for, um, um, the, for the fact that in, even in the cases that, that, that I've shown you here, it's the case that you could argue that there are different, different forms, okay? So um, to me, I mean, I, 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 it, it's difficult to follow for me because I don't, I'm not a speaker of Conso, I'm not, I'm not a descriptivist, but she says there are, there are arguments that you do not have to assume that these, are, uh, that these work like inflections. So this is, this, is, this is everything I can say. Um, so maybe um, it seems as if these are inflections, but in fact, they are not. Um, or um, if there are inflections, then it seems to be the case that uh, things work differently in console. But of course, we would have to come up with, a, with an explanation for that. And at the moment, um, we do not have one. No. But well spotted. Yeah. It's good. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, exactly. I mean, very, very good. Um, thank you, um, Marit, that you bring brought this up. When I was preparing the talk, I was exactly thinking the the same thing. I should. I should. Um, get involved with someone uh, here in the audience and do this experiment in Norwegian. Uh, Herbert Schriefers and I, we did it with a um, long time ago with a student from, from Bergen, um, but, but, but it was a student project and the data were not clear, okay? So we did this a long time ago, but there were no clear results. And um, I mean, the predictions are clear, so we should just, Try it again and 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 do it in a in a I don't know in a better way in a more controlled way and yeah and do the experiment and then see what comes out because it could yeah could also eh, give us interesting um, um, information about the theoretical con, um, discussion that is going on in, in in Norwegian and maybe also in Danish yeah Well, what we think, I mean, we don't, we don't know for sure, of course, but we think um, that because the indefinite article works like an adjective, so it works like, it seems to be, or behaves like an ad 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 adjective, actually. So you make the gender distinction by um, basically inflecting the um, indefinite article, whereas you have a, a freestanding um, morpheme for the, um, for the definite article. 
And therefore, for the definite article, we already knew that you found the effect. But if you do the exact same experiment with the exact same pictures, and you just change the instruction and, and ask people to now name the pictures with the indefinite article, the effect goes away. And we think this is because of the, of the because the change, um, because there's an, an inflection, which is not a freestanding morphine, okay? You mean in the in the, for the indefinite case? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing, no, no, not not for the for the indefinite not because there is only one indefinite article in Dutch. It's always been. Yeah. So you cannot you cannot test the experiment in you cannot run the experiment in Dutch because you would come up with a null. Uh, you, your prediction would be a null result. So it's not really you know it's not really interesting to do it. Um, but in, in in German we did the experiment and we did not find the effect for the indefinite. Huh? When we compare masculine to, to feminine, when we do exactly the same experiment with masculine and feminine in the uh, definite format, we find the effect. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in, in Norwegian, for example, you could run it because then your, 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 your prediction would be you should not find the effect in the definite case, whereas in the indefinite, you should find it, right? Yes. Well, I mean, except for the last one where we where we had, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I think, I mean, um, this semantic interference effect is a very well known effect in introduction. Um, and there were, there are still discussions going on about the, um, the origin of the effect, but I think that, that, that most people would, 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 would say that when you um, have to produce a noun, a picture, you have to name a picture and another a word comes up that is in the same semantic category, it, the, the two words, uh, the, the target and the distractor are in competition with each other. And because they are in the same category, actually the distractor word gets activation, not only from the word itself, but also from the picture name or from the picture, okay? And that's why it's such a strong uh, um, um, distractor. And, and to resolve this competition just takes time and therefore you are, you are, you are slower. So you cannot really, we know that in, in production, you cannot really ignore the distractor word because it's, it's just, you know, you just have to process it. Now, um, why you apparently can ignore or neglect the distractor word or a word in comprehension, um, I don't know, but but I mean, it, it could be that that it's not it's not relevant to the same degree as in production. Yeah, maybe 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 you could you could show me 
um, you or tell me a little bit more about your setup later on, um, and, and and then we could we could we could we could discuss this because it may be it may be a technical thing. Um, it may also be um, it may also have to do with a, with a task. Okay, um, um, this this the semantic interference effect in production is a very it's a very well known and it, it's a very uh, robust effect. Um, although when you look at the literature, there has just been a, um, a meta-analysis by Audrey, uh, Audrey Berkey again, who showed that, um, yeah, there is, in, there is usually an effect of about 20 milliseconds around, so 20 milliseconds interference, but it's not always significant. And in fact, it does not always show up in the data. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't really know what it means, okay? So it's still, it's, it's not that robust as I may have um, 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 given you the impression. So uh, we have to be careful, with, like with all the um, scientific results that we have. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have, we have. It's, it's a very interesting um, suggestion. Um, actually, um, something similar exists in German. Um, when you think about things like ein Stück Kuchen, ein Stück Torte, so Stück means a piece of, right? Um, you also have a Scheibe, eine Scheibe Wurst, eine Scheibe Brot. So you can use um, these these words also as as yeah, they they seem to work a little bit like yeah, they seem to resemble the usage of classifiers and it would be interesting to to um, investigate these more more systematically yeah i completely agree now okay so who can can you see the questions that are um in the uh in the chat, okay. Hello. Can I ask some question? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I have some question, and one is they're quite related to each other. The first question is, but they're mostly related to the Mandarin classifier projects. I'm a little bit wondering how much can you interpret the classifier contingency effect. As it is, or it is rather a reflection of a, fre a frequency effect, where like you suggested, for example, in your example, you said you have a target of a rabbit, and you have a, a destructor like a call, and you. But like I mean, the classifier for the rabbit can be used for call as well, but relatively less frequent than using it for rabbit. So I'm thinking if ever consider or somehow circumvent it, this problem of like how much it is telling you to classify a contingency effect rather than a frequency effect. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not, or obviously I'm not, an, um, 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 I don't speak Chinese. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. So I have to rely on um, um, the information that, that my collaborators give me. And um, what I know, what I understand from them is that in Chinese, there are um, so-called generic classifiers. Um, yes. And what we um, actually try to do is to um, generally avoid those in our studies. So that's the first thing. Uh, and um, whenever um, um, people, uh, our participants um, use the classifier that was not expected, then these were counted as uh, um, as an error, 
Um, okay. So these were not taken into account when we did the analysis. Um, so um, therefore, um, as far as I know, we can um, very much exclude these frequency effects because um, uh, yeah, we, we, we try to, to take care of those beforehand. But in how okay. far we succeeded in, in this exactly um, is, of course, uh, yeah, a matter of debate, I guess. Yeah, sure. I'm wondering, like, when you also, when you compare L2 speakers to monolingual speakers, maybe the effect size of con uh, classified contingency will tell you something about that. I mean, if it is a frequency effect at all, then we probably should assume yeah. uh, the yeah, effect size in L2 speakers would be higher, larger. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, could, that could be what we did in the, in the L2 study was actually, um, we had to um, find L2 speakers of Chinese whose um, um, proficiency in Chinese was high enough to use and distinguish between different classifiers. So that was why we were um, relying on, on L2 speakers at relatively high level of proficiency. Um, because the, um, um, the speakers that we tried to use before that um, were uh, lower in proficiency and they, they could just not distinguish and produce the classifiers that were expected of them. So um, we had to, use, to, to, to change our strategy. And the, um, um, uh, yeah, and the, and the, um, the words that we use also had to, I mean, they had to be in the vocabulary of these learners because otherwise it would not make sense, obviously. So there are, there are issues in, in doing these experiments with uh, uh, second language learners of, uh, of Chinese, definitely. Yeah. The last question, sorry. Um, um, you suggested that uh, quant uh, classifiers might be similar to gender per se. Yeah. But I'm wondering, like, I'm not so sure about gender, but I know in Mandarin, it is not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So like uh, one noun can have two or at least, at least two. At least one, but they have two or three classifiers. But so I, I assume in gender system, like the noun, we only have only one gender. Would you, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, actually, um, it's also the case that that the gender uh, for gender, gender can also be a little bit variable. So there are words, for example, that have uh, several genders. There are um, words that that different people use with different genders. So um, it's also, it's, it's, it's not completely one-to-one. Um, -one. So it seems to be the case that there's also some, that it, it's a little bit fluid um, when you look at certain cases. Um, so that may not be a um, complete, completely different from the usage of uh, classifiers in Chinese. Okay, thank you so much, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's very interesting. And, and, and of, I mean, we, we thought about doing an experiment like this um, before. Um, um, the thing is that, that it was too difficult to find enough material to, to, to be able to, you know, find also enough pictures. And, and it, it was just, we, we found some items, but not enough to do an experiment. So that was the, 
so that's that's the first thing so what we what we what we did is we did an experiment in in comprehension where we tried to disentangle um like grammatical gender in german for example interacts a little bit with semantics but also with phonology so um you can you can show that there are phonological factors that determine the gender of some nouns but also um uh, semantic factors and um and they also seem to interact to some degree and um so we did an experiment but that was a comprehension experiment where we you know where you just where you presented the words to to participants and then they had to either did do um, um gender or determine decisions and what we found was that we, we could we could show that there are that there are effects of semantics but there are also effects of some of, of phonology so it seems to be the case that that semantics independently of the of the word itself also plays a role which is i mean i i find this very intriguing and very interesting what it exactly means uh yeah i have i have I have some ideas about this, but it, it goes probably too far. We, we could talk about this later on. But um, 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 so it seems to be the case that that even these, um, even when the when the system seems to be opaque in terms of um, uh, uh, semantics, that there are semantic factors that determine or that that influence the gender processing of certain words. Does that make sense? And I would I would like to hear more about these these languages that you just that you just um, um, named and and 